It is not a local institution. It is worldwide. After all, the Catholic Church has experienced similar periods of decadence, similar to the one, I say, which we have, but not identical. Back in the days of 1453, at the downfall of Constantinople, there was a serious decadence in Catholicism throughout Europe. It was the end of the Crusades. The Crusades were erroneous wars, blessed by the popes, blessed by the church, for all Christianity in Europe was united against Islamism and the Arabians, the Mohammedans. And despite all that St. Paul said about the armory of a Christian, the sword of faith and the shield and buckler of truth and all such things, they chose to put aside St. Paul's warning and use the steel sword of revenge and the conquest of paganism with force, brutality, and savagery. Well, you know, for a period of over 600 years, these crusade wars lasted. It drained Europe of its best youth. Not only that, it drained Europe of its morality. It drained Europe of its faith. And it drained Europe of its love for the papacy and all that the papacy represented. It was a warmongering ideal amongst many people, and it was only there to support the unification of princes and kings and emperors who were bound under the deus vote, God wills it, to conquer the Mohammedans and the Arabian people and the Arabian oil and the Mohammedans. You can't make converts with a sword of steel. 1453 marked that and certified that because then came the Renaissance, as they called it euphemistically. The Renaissance mean the Greek pagan culture, the Islamitic culture, the culture of Alexandria and Cairo, the culture of a material concept of life, for that's all in its final effect that Mohammedanism was. And so from 1453 on, for over a hundred years or so, the papacy and Europe and Christendom in Europe glorified in its materialities. And finally came the Reformation, long, long needed, a real reformation, because there had been the sale of indulgences, if you like, but far worse than the sale of indulgences, there had been the sale of corporeality, the sale of bodies, the sale of human beings in the slavery of feudalism, the slavery of classism. And those were some of the salient things that were not mentioned too frequently when argumentation was held about the Eucharist and penance and the sacraments and the supremacy of the Pope. At last, then, Europe went on its way. And his desire to have more than one wife illegally, there would have been no great revolution against the papacy, except England took the forward step. The British Empire was against the Vatican State. And so we had that affair. Then came another date of importance. If we wish to gauge even the local affairs of Detroit or Cleveland, or New York, or any other place around here. You have the other affair that was cyclic in this world, the Industrial Revolution. And it gave man's muscles a chance to rest and made machinery do the work of the muscle. It enabled man to produce ten bushels of wheat where one used to grow. It enabled man to propel his boats across the Atlantic with steam instead of sail. 
It enabled man to spin his wheels in the factory and produce a welcome news to all the housewives, to all the laborers, to all the people of mankind. But on top of this came the idea, well, what are we going to do about wages for the poor men? They are producing about five times more than they used to produce. Are we going to pay them just the same salary they formerly had? And yes, said some, no, said others. And it was marvelous, marvelous how the Episcopate of England, of Germany, of France, of Italy, of Belgium and Harlem and elsewhere were silent when they should have spoken out on the basis that men are brothers, not meant to be slaves of one another. A man came along by the name of Karl Marx, and he wrote a thesis on this point. He went so far as to say that we've had enough of Christianity, we've had enough of religion, but it came time for Christianity to make a decision in favor of the poor. Christianity was silent, and Das Kapital, Das Kapital, was the new Bible of the anti-ecclesiastical forces, of the anti-religious forces. This was all in the time, practically, of Leo the Thirteenth. Well, at last then came a pope whose voice was heard, a pope whose pen wrote not only the humanum genus saying that this material concept of life that was invented by the Mohammedans was all wrong, a voice of a pope who said that you must treat the laboring class as if they're human beings and brothers or else give up Christianity, the voice of a pope who said, let's get down to the practicalities of Christianity or else Christianity will fail. And who paid attention to Leo the Thirteenth and his Rerum Novarum in 1891? Very, very few. An odd voice in Germany, an odd voice in Belgium or Holland and England, but it was an odd voice, very odd, because the voices of the Episcopate were playing with the voices of the members of Parliament and the members of House of Lords and with the Senate and with the Parliaments all over the world. No, the Catholic hierarchy had not traded their faith, but they had traded their courage. They were afraid. You know, when I was going to school, we were told that there were two versions of the New Testament, the King James Version and the Dewey Vaughan Bible. The King James Testament had an omitted the epistle of St. James, who said, Faith without good works is dead. And quite an ado was made of that in all the theological classes at Toronto University. Of course, the Wesleyans had their version. The Episcopalians had theirs. The Catholics had theirs. And then there was the neuter version of all. But you know, it was only in later years when a professor from the Sorbonne University was handling some of us in our theological course, and he was questioning the very translation of this word, faith without good works is dead. And he came up with this idea. He says, no, that's a mismeaning that people have attached to it. Because the real meaning is this. Faith without heroic deeds is dead. Your faith will be lost if you're not a hero. Your faith will be lost if you don't fight for it. Your faith will be lost if you're a compromiser with hell. Well, you know that interpretation by Dr. Cushing in those days before 1920, or closer to 1912, impressed me, and always impressed me. And I looked on that interpretation of faith without good works, meaning faith without heroic deeds will die. I've looked on that as something very, very important in the life and in the progress and in the prosperity of Christianity throughout the world. 
I saw this faith without heroic deeds in the lives of those who went to take care of the lepers. I saw this faith without heroic deeds in the life of those nuns who sacrificed themselves in hospitals to care for the sick without ever any advantage of wages. Without heroic deeds, oftentimes in the lives of parish priests in the country, in the life of my own bishop, in the life of Bishop Gallagher, who was an olding man, not quite too old, drove about this large, large archdiocese, three dioceses in one at that time, confirming day in and day out, snow, ice, cold, nothing bothered that old man, that heroic man who put the ideals of the Holy Spirit and the ideals of the sowing of faith first in all his activities as a bishop. Well, that's beside the point. Leo XIII wrote his Rerum Novarum in vain. Forty years later, Pius XI came along, and he wrote another book called Quadragesimo Anno, which means 40 years after, 40 years after Leo's book. And he practically reiterated everything that Leo said, he did take some things that were meant to be socialistic by some who cared to make it so. For instance, he had a phrase in this book, there's some things so important that they should be owned publicly. Oh yes, that might mean energy. It might mean postal service. It might mean water. It might mean garbage collection. But nevertheless, what he said was likewise set aside, and on its merry way went Marxism. Marxism in 1914 took its first step forward, and what a failing step it was. By the end of World War that started in 1914 and culminated in 1918, Marxism as it was called communism at the time in Russia, was about to fail when a president of the United States by the name of Mr. Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, bailed out communism in Russia and was the first nation in all the world to identify himself shaking the bloody hand of Stalin who had persecuted millions upon millions of Ukrainians and other Christians because they refused to accept the doctrine there is no God, because they refused to accept the doctrine of a materialistic concept of life. Mr. Roosevelt, don't you forget, the United States, don't you forget, was the first nation in the world to support failing Marxism. Well, World War I set communism up. World War I saw the departure of one of the empires because it was a war to see which empire, the German Empire or the British Empire, would survive. Then came that period between 1918 and the 1940s a period of distress, a period of the remaking of Europe, a period of refashioning the thinking of Europe, a period when Immanuel Kant was dragged from his tomb together with Fichte, Schelling, Hagen, and Schopenhauer, a period when all the ironies and all the hatreds and all the ambiguities of the French Revolution of 1789 were taken from their graveyards and were practiced with their liberty, their equality, and their fraternity as if liberty was the thing of the hour. And so the Depression came then, all through 29, all through Roosevelt's era, the Depression came after we had built the factories in Europe 
after we had fed the peoples in Europe, the Depression came. And yet, two great factors of Marxism have raised their ugly heads to gain control of the world. They didn't know enough to harmonize. They didn't know enough to unite. They thought each was to be lord of the world. And here you have Stalin on the one side and Hitler on the other side. Here you have the left wing of the bird of prey and the right wing of the bird of prey about to seek supremacy of the world. And here you have the United States again joining in with one against the other. Probably I was about the only voice of the time on radio which protested our entrance into this war, not because I took the side of Germany, not because I was against the side of Stalin, but because both were hostile, both had promised the dissolution of Christianity, both had promised the dissolution of freedom. Not liberty, mind you, but freedom. By the way, do you know the difference between freedom and liberty? Did you ever hear of the word libertine? Libertine has something nauseous about it. Libertine has something that is rather under the table about it. Liberty is not what Christ taught. Freedom is what he taught. What is freedom? Freedom is the ability to act, to do, to think within the circumference of the natural law. Liberty means that you want to break through that circumference, be a privileged character, and do what the individual thinks instead of what the natural law thinks. There's a difference. There's a difference. Well, nevertheless, we're coming down to the post-period after World War II. Those who opposed going into the war at all at that time were renegades. I was supposed to be a Nazi. I was supposed to be one who hated the United States. I was supposed to be one because he did not approve of war on one side of those devils against the other devil who was hostile to his country. Well, the war is over. Who won the war? Russia won the war. Hitlerism is gone. But the whole world has become more or less Marxianized, not communized. Ladies and gentlemen, communism has been dead for 10 or 15 years. People don't go around anymore carrying communist cards in their pockets as they do cards to purchase gas, to purchase food. There are no card-carrying communists. There are Marxists. Marxism is the materialistic concept of life. Marxism means getting God out of the schools. Marxism means making murder traps out of hospitals. Marxism means putting libertines at the top of nature's paragons of excellence. Marxism means living for the almighty dollar as if the dollar can sub sustain itself for more than a year or ten years, or a century, but it can't sustain itself forever, nor can it reach down into a grave and bring your corpse forth for life everlasting. That's what is wrong today. Well, what's all this about with Catholicism and Detroit? Catholicism and Detroit. I remember I was the only voice at the time preaching against war. There's never been a good war except a war in self-defense. A war to stain our freedom in the United States when England was trying to tax us out of existence. There never was a, such a thing as a good war except a war where you're fighting to protect the life of your wife and your children and your religion and your God and your hereafter as well as your properties here. Very few of those wars have ever been fought in the history of the world. Most wars have been fought by marauders 
like an Alexander the Great. Most wars have been fought by marauders, like the original fascists, the triumvirate of Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, who tried to take in the whole world and make the world sustain an empire of greed, of lust, of Juno, of Venus, of Jupiter, and finally of Augustus Caesar, the little Pimpernel, who called himself God. Well, that's the war. And those who protested against the war, including a dead friend of mine, Charles Lindbergh, those who protested the war, including those great senators, William Bora, Burton Wheeler, Robert Harris, and such men as those, they were all miscreants in a way. But then came, <coughs> pardon me, then came this period in which we're in, the period of the decadence of the Catholic Church. What do I mean? Well, following the war, the bishops have not changed their attitude one whit from what existed in the days of the Medicis and the Muslims. Haven't changed one whit from the days of Henry VIII when the bishops turned against the Pope and when the Pope permitted poor John Fisher to go to his grave and scaffold on London Bridge rather than support him before it was too late. Oh, he supported him at the end, but he didn't support him in the beginning. He didn't send his cohorts into England to speak against this old whoremonger, Henry VIII. And so it is. What's wrong today? Catholicism has slipped in America. I'd say 33% of the Catholics who were here 25 years ago are not Catholics in practice any longer. I would say that the Catholic schools today, many of them closed and many others should be closed for what's being taught in them, certainly do not reflect the Catholicism of our ancestors. I would say that the convents, many of them, with their peculiarly dressed nuns, and many of them with their peculiar thinking nuns, were better if they had been laicized years ago. And I would say, if quite a few of the priests, who are still priests, would quit the church honorably and get out, but that's not going to happen. No. What should happen? Now, here's the story. Don't blame Archbishop Dearden too much for what's going on here in Detroit. Don't blame any other bishop and any other diocese of the United States for what's going on there. Do you know, do you know that uh, this detente of Mr. Kissinger's has been a practiced policy in one sense in the Catholic Church for the past three papacies? Pius XII was a detenteur. John the twenty third was a detenteur, and our present Pope, Paul the Sixth, is a detenteur. They all should join in with Henry Kissinger. They all belong to his club. They all give more than they get. They all surrender more than they achieve. And it's been that way. That way now for some years. And when Vatican II was called, the bishops of the world assembled. I don't know what they did about Marxism that was of any value. I don't know that they reassembled the young men of Italy or of Belgium or Holland or America or England or elsewhere and said, go forth and preach the gospel to every creature even at the cost of death. I don't know that. But I do know that nothing has been accomplished in all their detentism. Let's get the right name. All their ecumenism. Have I hit the word? That's the word that I wanted. 
That's the ecclesiastical word for Henry Kissinger's detente word. I remember when Archbishop Dearden came back from Vatican II, one of his first sermons was down on the east end of Detroit, I think it was in Gross Point, where he preached a beautiful sermon in a church whose members did not believe definitely in the sacrifice of the Mass or in the sacraments, in a church that did not believe in the supremacy of the Pope. My God, at the same time, people, Catholics, were pre wondering, 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 and hungry, hungry, hungry for the truth that had happened at Vatican II. That was his first great mistake. That turned away quite a number of older priests. I know it. I'm one of them. And I felt like turning away, and I kept my mouth shut all these years. And so did my compeers. So did my compeers. That was a horrible mistake. For you can't have detente with Satan, and you can't have ecumenism with error. <coughs> now, either the Catholic Church is right in the supremacy of the Pope, or it's terribly wrong. If it's right, why shake hands with somebody who says it's wrong and say, let the two of us on get together? The two of us will hitch up, and we'll go down the road, and we come to a crossroad, you go to the left, and I'll go to the right, and... Goodbye to the tally hole that's being dragged behind them and all its passengers. That's about the size of it. Well, so don't blame Archbishop Dearden now for this thing that's going on. I'm becoming to be a very old man, but I don't care about that. I'm still young and able to think a little bit. And I do know this, that we've had too much detentism and too much ecumenism and too much... Well, softiness in the papacy for many years. Leo the Thirteenth couldn't put his cross across the words of his gospel in 1891. And it has been so since, not one pope has been able to do it, including Pius XI, the fighting pope who would have done it. But... His Secretary of State, Cardinal Pacelli, who became Pius XII, came to America, and under blackmail from President Roosevelt, sacrificed me from preaching against America's entrance into war. That's the truth of it. I kept my mouth shut, and I still keep it shut. But it's public now. Because Mr. Roosevelt certainly made a mistake, became the warmonger of all times, became the aid and a better of communism for all times, and communism that's now dead has degenerated back into its bed of Marxism together with Nazism and fascism, and modern American democracy, which is not much better, and which is following the footsteps of Khrushchev and the rest of them. It won't be long. Now, don't blame Archbishop Dearden. There's a weakness in Rome. And you know that since the beginning, from the first Pope Peter down to the last Pope, Paul VI, we've had nearly all Italians or Jews. The first few popes were all Jews. Why not? The Catholic Church was born on the, in the womb of Jewry. Christ was a Jew. His mother was a Jew. The twelve apostles were Jews. All the early saints were great Jews until Peter came over to Rome, and then you get a few like Sebastian, and Agnes, the Roman patricians, and the Roman soldiers. Then you go over to Asia, I mean to Arabian Asia, and there were people over there who were wonderful. One, my favorite, a boy by the name of Athanasius, a 24-year-old boy in the year 325, 
When Arianism first came up, and Arianism said that Christ wasn't God, he was just a wonderful man, Athanasius met at the Council of Nicaea and single-handedly beat down 70% of those who said Christ wasn't God, and they admitted that he was Christ, the Son of God. But only for a short time. The Council of Nicaea was over in 325, in a short few years afterwards, Athanasius was the Bishop of Alexandria, and all the bishops again put a price on his head together with the rulers of Islam. He must die. <coughs> of course, Islam wasn't really born. It was a borning at the time. And from then on to the year 600, 700, it was a borning. And finally Muhammad came, but I'm talking about Athanasius. Athanasius like John Fisher. Athanasius like Thomas of Becket. Athanasius like mid in our day paid the price for believing that faith without noble deeds is dead. And to conclude these remarks, open up your Bible at the last book in the Bible called the Apocalypse. Open it up. Read what John the Evangelist did. Each evangelist, when he went out to establish his area for Christianity, was practically a pope. Practically, not absolutely. But John established seven dioceses. And, you know, five of them had to be castigated, if not excommunicated. John had what you call noble deeds. He wasn't afraid. He was not afraid. Nor was John Fisher afraid at a later date. But against all the bishops of England, he says, no, if the Pope is in right, all Christianity is just a folly. You need a few bishops today. You need a Pope today who's not afraid... As Christ says, if your eye scandalizes you, pluck it out. Christ believed in surgery. Christ believed in excommunication. Christ believed if you don't come along with me, get off my boat. You're either with me or against me. But I'm not going to shake hands with you. I'm not going to play detente with you. I'm not going to play ecumenism with you if it means that I have to sacrifice a principle. And that's the message I have today on this whole thing. Don't blame Archbishop Dearden. It's about time we have a good fighting football coach made bishop after his long theological experience, a boy who knows what contact is, a boy who knows what fighting is, a boy who knows what a broken leg is and won't give in. We've had probably too many European popes and detenters and ex communicants. God bless Archbishop Dearden. God bless the youth of America. Maybe one of you boys will rise up yet to wear the crown of Peter and draw Christianity together. Meanwhile, let us stand back at the Pope. We must follow him in matters of faith and morals, but no one has ever said that we must follow him when he tries to assemble all the troops of Europe to fight the Muslim men in the Crusades. No one says we must follow him when he remains silent as Spain fights for her liberties. No one says we must follow him in matters of politics as Archbishop Cardinal Pacelli followed him, followed Roosevelt. I know what I am talking about. The price was... The silence over Cardinal Mundelein and the insolent affair that was never known and which I will not disclose now. 
and I was a willing victim. But we need to believe that the church is the church militant, not the church ecumenical. We need to believe that the church is the church militant, going out and fighting with the sword of faith, which generally means that you will lose the battles on this earth, but win the battle of eternity and the battle of truth. And by the way, what's truth? Christ is truth. It was John the Evangelist who defined Christ as truth. Do you remember in the beginning of his gospel? And the truth was made flesh. Verbum caro factum est. Truth always.